Now, the initial title for uh, Doan's talk was going to be, I think, something like, how can, you know, complex, how can complexity economics help us? Uh, well, I thought I'd go up one level of ambition in titling my talk and ask, can complexity economics save the world? Um, now, uh, this is going to be a bit more of a philosophical uh, talk rather than a scientific talk. Uh, but what I hope to do uh, is raise some issues that will then, you know, set up the more scientific discussion that the next speakers and, and the rest of the afternoon uh, will bring to us. And in that spirit, I'm going to start off with a, a philosophical question, which is, what is the economy? What is the economy? What kind of a system is this? Well, there's uh, a, a wonderful phrase that the historian um, uh, Noah Yuval Harari has called imagined orders. And uh, I would argue that the economy doesn't exist in reality. It's a product of our imagination. It's made up by human beings. It exists in our heads. The economy is made out of ideas. And if you look at all of the economic ideas and concepts that we use very commonly, whether it's economic value or money or markets or growth or GDP, wages, the idea of a job, all of these things are concepts that were made up at some point in our history. You know, they're not part of the physical world or immutable laws or physics. They're human conceptions. So the economy is a product of our imagination. It's an imagined order. Now, this imagined order has evolved quite dramatically over time. Our economic arrangements have changed a lot from hunter-gatherer days to agriculture, industrial, modern capitalism. And that imagined order then does have it, an effect, an impact on the real physical world. It changes our physical world. Um, you know, when something happens in the economy, buildings get built, food gets grown and delivered, products get made, and so on. And we've seen the impact on our physical world going from, uh, at, at a planetary level, from the Holocene to what now is being called the Anthropocene. Now, as this has unfolded, we're now beginning to realize that the imagined order that we have is not succeeding. And this is my failure of the current system on one chart slide. So on the uh, x-axis, we have social thresholds for humanity, and you can see what they are. And on the y-axis, we have biophysical boundaries uh, that have been breached. And you can see in the upper right, there's a whole set of societies that have succeeded pretty well socially in providing material and social benefits for their population, but are breaching a whole set of biophysical boundaries and literally destroying the planet. And on the lower left, a group of societies that are having relatively little biophysical impact, uh, but are failing on, on multiple social dimensions. We need to be up here. And there is literally no society on Earth that is. So our imagined order is not delivering on the two great priorities that it has, is delivering human well-being and a sustainable planet. Now, What's inside this imagined order that organizes our economy in the way we have it today? Well, I like to think of it as a set of nested Russian dolls. So we have the economic system, and then within that, we have a set of economic and political ideologies, sort of ideas about how things should be organized, really sort of normative ideas. And then inside that doll, we've got a set of theories, uh, economic theories, uh, positive explanations about how the system works. And then underneath that, there's a set of theories about behavior, about how human beings work, because after all, economies are made out of people. And at the very bottom of that are some ideas about moral philosophy, about what's good and bad and right and wrong. And the system we have today, when you unpack it at a high level, can be thought of as modern market capitalism. Um, at least in the West, the dominant ideology is often called by historians now neoliberalism. Uh, the dominant economic theory for the past many decades is neoclassical economics. There's an idea of behavior rooted in what could be called homo economicus, and it's based on a moral philosophy of maximizing utilitarianism, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And you, you know, we, we can look at the history of how this current thought system came to be, and we see you know, there's a set of intellectual ideas in the smaller Russian dolls that came to dominance in the, largely in the 19th through 20th uh, century. Um, the ideas came into kind of political dominance really in the 1970s through 2010s, and then really geopolitical dominance, that these ideas have really dominated most of the world uh, in the last uh, several decades. 
And you know, there's different variations on this system. There's kind of a, you know, put in crude terms, a more sort of conservative version of you know, uh, more markets, less state, and a more progressive version of, of uh, you know, more market interference. So you think of maybe you know, the US and Singapore or something on the right doll, and you know, Norway and Sweden on, on the left doll. Uh, but largely built off of the same kind of imagined order and idea system. And, you know, we have politics in this system and big fights between these kind of two, two branches and, and, and arguments uh, about, you know, which is better and so on. But the reality is that both of these branches lead here to mass extinction. Um, you know, Norway is no more on a, you know, path to a sustainable planet that delivers the upper left of that graph uh, than is Singapore or the US or, or, or any other country. So instead of fighting up there, we need to be fighting back down here at the core root of the ideas that have created this system from the moral philosophy and the economic theories up to the ideology. Now if we go back in history and look at why do we think about the economy the way we do, um, just exactly as David said, the roots of our thinking lie back from long dead thinkers centuries ago. And in that little doll of moral foundations, um, uh, there's been some very good scholarship on the huge shift that happened from kind of pre-Hobbes and Bentham, where moral, uh, you know, I can basically summarize a, a, a thousand years of moral philosophy in a few sentences, um, which is that basically that human nature was a battle between our desire to be good and our temptations to behave badly, and that basically we should treat each other as we want to be treated ourselves, the golden rule, and we should try to kind of rein in our worst instincts. Uh, and that there was some idea of, of morality as a part of character and so on. And, you know, lots of different flavors and debates about this, but this was kind of the rough framework. And then Hobbes and Bentham uh, came along and had a radically different idea about human morality. They said that seeking pleasure and avoiding pain is just kind of human nature, and it's neither good nor bad itself, it's just who we are. But what matters is the consequences or actions of that and that moral behavior uh, maximizes the most pleasure for the most people and minimizes the most pain. That's the sort of core idea of utilitarianism. And other things like character intentions and so on don't really matter. What matters is consequences, or what the philosophers call consequentialism. Now, this was quite a radical shift in moral thinking, but it got adopted very heavily in the new field of economics that was just starting to develop uh, around that time. And that then translated into a theory of human behavior, what we call homo economicus, that we now know today is really pseudoscience. It's not empirically valid, but this idea that humans are self-regarding kind of pleasure machines or pleasure maximizers and rational calculators of utility. And if you look at, again at the history of this, you see that the early thinkers were trying to make this kind of more of a science, like rather than a philosophy, more like physics, and be able to uh, create mathematical uh, theories about individual behavior based on this uh, idea. But, um, Steve Pinker has a very nice phrase uh, he calls armchair anthropology. And this was really armchair psychology. That basically what these guys did was they sat in an armchair with a you know, glass of poor whiskey swirled around and said, I think human beings are pleasure maximizers and pain minimizers. And I think they pursue that in a rational way. They had no evidence, no empirical work. There was nothing scientific about it. It was a, you know, a, a purely made up uh, exercise of philosophy. Yet it came to really dominate um, are thinking about human behavior in the social sciences for a couple centuries afterwards. Um, this then led to some more normative implications, uh, notably this idea, quite crudely, that greed is good and greed creates prosperity. Now, who thought of that idea? Did Adam Smith, right? The invisible hand. Wrong. Adam Smith did not think that at all. That's actually a myth created by Milton Friedman that Adam Smith thought that. Uh, that's another story I can tell you. But Smith was actually a very subtle thinker about moral philosophy and wrote a whole book on it. Really, these ideas about the kind of uh, self-interested maximization of markets leads to good social outcomes really comes from a different crowd called the marginalists who came long after Smith, who gave us the kind of modern, what are, you know, been the dominant economic ideas about uh, uh, individuals maximizing their behavior and markets leading to good uh, social uh, outcomes. This then led to a kind of systems theory uh, of the economy, uh, developed mostly by this chap, Leon uh, Walras, um, where again, he was trying to make economics uh, more uh, quantitative and, and more scientific. And so he developed the concept of the economy as an equilibrium system, as an optimizing system, that is essentially static, 
uh, and separable from other systems in, in the social sciences. And then that led to a set of kind of normative ideas about what's good in the economy, about markets being efficient, uh, governments being less efficient, price equaling value, GDP being a proxy for human welfare, that the point of the economy is to maximize GDP growth and a whole set of, of, of other things that have become you know, part of the uh, intellectual environment and, and uh, uh, political and, and uh, policy environment. Then uh, we had uh, political thinkers and theorists who then turned those into kind of memes and norms that got operationalized in our politics and our policies. You know, the sort of idea, greed is good, uh, maximizing pleasure from consumption is, is the goal. Uh, a billion acts of selfishness will lead to a prosperous society. The social duty is just to maximize its profits. There's no such thing as society, only individuals. That was Margaret Thatcher's famous quote. Markets are efficient, other institutions are not. The value of something to society is its market price. You're paid what you're worth. You have to choose between equity and growth. And the environment is a resource to be exploited. Now, these are all highly contestable statements. They get debated a lot in our discourse and our politics. But this is kind of the very crude, cartoonish interpretation that's come out of economics into the popular culture. These are the memes that were produced by that thought system. Now, what I would argue is that if we look at these from a modern scientific standpoint, as opposed to an armchair anthropology, armchair psychology standpoint, they actually look pretty absurd. And I've always liked this quote from, from John Stuart Mill, and I expect that someday, looking backwards, we will see just how absurd these ideas were. Um, and if we now fast forward to SFI and, and the modern world, we don't have to be armchair anthropologists and psychologists anymore. We actually have real science and data on a lot of these things, and a lot of it's been done here at SFI. So we know that homo sapiens are not like homo economicus, that real human decision making is inductive and heuristic, uh, modular, emotionally intelligent, and highly, highly social. And one of the big revolutions in social science has been really understanding humans as social creatures, that we can be both selfish and groupish, reciprocal, cooperative, altruistic, uh, intuitively moral, hierarchical, tribal, or a whole set of characteristics about humans as social animals that get left out of most uh, economic uh, analysis. We also know that the economy is not an equilibrium system. This was one of the you know, key debates in the founding workshop of SFI back in the, in the 1980s uh, uh, when the economics program was founded. Uh, and I've always loved this quote from John Holland, if it's in equilibrium, it must be dead. And so we've had this notion, which SFI has been at the forefront of, of identifying the economy uh, ontologically as a complex adaptive system, not as an equilibrium system. And this has a whole set of implications uh, for economic uh, behavior, which many of you are very, uh, very familiar with. And I, I, I'm sure Brian Arthur will talk more about this in, in depth uh, this evening. But it gives a very dramatically different view of how the economy behaves as a system from the view coming out of those Russian dolls uh, that I showed uh, before. Um, I would also argue that we can start to construct a new conception of economic value based on the kind of ideas that uh, uh, SFI and other complexity scientists have been uh, developing. Uh, notably that the economy can be thought of as an order creating system, that it takes inputs, matter and energy from low order high entropy and transforms them in a kind of economic metabolism to all the products and services and social and physical order uh, that we see in the economy. And it does this by utilizing knowledge from what uh, some call physical and social technologies and obeying the laws of thermodynamics, produce waste, heat, gases, uh, et cetera, that have consequences for the biophysical uh, environment. And that this order creating activity in the economy uh, helps solve human problems. It helps deliver things to us that um, meet our needs and, and, and wants and, and create uh, value for us. And uh, uh, again, you know, I, uh, this is a very different conception of economic value from what's in the kind of traditional neoclassically based uh, view of the world, but integrates uh, ideas from uh, physics and information theory, uh, biology and evolutionary theory to provide a very different perspective on how value is created in the economy. So if we take this more modern SFI rooted uh, perspective of complexity economics, we can start to see the outlines of how we might create a new imagined order 
that would be much more connected, uh, grounded in science and connected to the reality of, of the societies and the planet that we all live in. And I'll just briefly uh, sketch out uh, a scientific research agenda uh, that might help us do that. There are huge questions uh, on each of these elements about how we would construct such a new view. Uh, deeper understanding of human cooperation and our pro-social uh, behaviors and uh, 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 moral foundations based in, again, real human uh, behavior and instincts. Um, a deeper understanding of how we create order in our physical and social environments and how that order evolves over time. Um, <clears throat> there was a, a recent article in the Wall Street Journal, some of you may have seen, uh, calling for a new, progress, a new science of progress. That we don't have a good theory of human progress. And it's actually quite true. Economics has never really had a good theory of progress. And that's because I think progress is fundamentally part of an evolution, is an evolutionary phenomena. And the kind of perspective that SFI brings to the table could create a true science of progress. Deeper understanding of economic value uh, and how the economy uh, impacts people's lives, and uh, understanding the economy as an emergent phenomena, uh, as uh, not the linear um, additive system of traditional economics, but understanding things like business cycles, booms and busts in financial markets, uh, growth, inflation, inequality, etc., as emergent phenomena. And then finally, how does this system called the economy co-evolve with the biosphere and planetary uh, systems? Uh, in the, in the complex, complex systems view, the environment is not an externality, it's not a system separate from the economy, but the economy is fully embedded in that larger uh, biophysical system. And I would argue, just to start closing, that if we did that, such uh, a, a new thought system, a new set of Russian dolls is possible. That we can have a moral philosophy based on our pro-social uh, behaviors and a deeper understanding of, of, of um, uh, human social behavior, uh, uh, a realistic uh, theory uh, of human decision making, uh, an economic theory based on uh, complex uh, systems. And I think that could lead to a new set of normative ideas about how the economy should work and a new set of political debates. Wouldn't necessarily end politics. It's not going to be, uh, as Keynes predicted in the, in the letter that David was quoting from, that economics will be as boring as dentistry because all the fights will be over, but rather we'll have a new and more productive set of things to argue about than we do today. And I think, uh, and in fact, I'm working on a new book uh, on what such a new ideology might look like, and we call it market humanism, and that's something I could talk more about uh, with folks later. And then I think that has the potential then to lead to uh, a, a, an economic system that uh, does a much better job at promoting both human flourishing uh, and non-human uh, flourishing uh, in helping us uh, sustain the one planet that we have. So if we did this, we could lead, that could lead to a new set of normative memes uh, in the popular uh, culture and our politics and our policies that greed is actually bad. It's bad for uh, social structures and social relations. Uh, maximizing human Flourishing and non-human flourishing is good. Prosperity comes from solving human problems. We solve human problems by cooperating. A billion acts of cooperation makes a prosperous society. Inclusion, fairness, and trust are the foundations of cooperation and thus the foundations of economic growth. The role of government is to foster security and help foster cooperation. The role of markets is to create competitions to cooperate to evolve new and better solutions to human problems. And the social duty of business is to solve human problems, and the moral duty of humankind is to protect life on Earth. So I think such a new set of scientific foundations could lead, and this is my take at what a, a new set of normative implications and cultural memes uh, that would come from that. So we could imagine then a new imagined order arising out of this new thinking and uh, new economic ideas that could lead to a very different kind of economy than the one we have today, and hopefully one that can bring us to the upper left of that chart that I showed us uh, uh, before. So can complexity economics save the world? It has to. Thank you.
we have lots of time for question and debate, so don't feel inhibited. And you mentioned the back there. Right. Very interesting talk, as always. And uh, uh, I mean, I, uh, I love the idea that Homo sapiens evolved much faster than all of the animals because they're able to make up stories that basically create this social cohesion and everything else. But throughout history, that emergence has been hijacked by ideology, by religion, and by, uh, uh, by capitalism in some, in some extenses. But today we see it being hijacked by social media. So to what extent these mechanisms are part of the whole system versus their disruptors to, to the system? So, uh, should, uh, David, should I take a few questions oh, just together? Or, or no, no, just, 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 just go, okay. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, you, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, you know, the develop, a key part of the development of human culture was our ability to have shared stories, shared narratives that then foster very large scale cooperation so we can cooperate uh, in very complex ways that are sustained over long periods of time. Uh, E.O. Wilson titled uh, one of his great books, The Social Conquest of Earth, and really the story of the social conquest of the Earth is a, sto is a story of stories. Uh, you know, Plato said, those who tell the stories rule society, and he was, he was right. And uh, our stories work best when they connect uh, with something in reality, that they tell us something about reality that can help us make human life better. And my interpretation of the Enlightenment was it created a whole set of mechanisms that connected our stories to reality. Science was one of those. Uh, democracy is another. Markets uh, are, are, are another uh, mechanism. But that hasn't stopped human beings from trying to hijack the stories we tell uh, to serve their own power and, and, and purposes, not always for the, for the benefit of, of larger societies. So that's a very old battle in human history between um, uh, you know, the, the self-serving stories of an elite and the stories uh, that can actually help um, uh, serve a uh, broader society. And part of what we've seen in our economics is um, elites used to appeal to gods, uh, to how our ancestors did it, um, to the natural order, you know, to justify their stories that justified their power and privilege. Well, uh, you know, over the last several decades, they found a new source of authority, economics. And so economics and, and economic kind of pseudoscience has been used to justify a lot of very self-serving uh, uh, behavior. Um, and it's also been used to justify a lot of behavior that we now know is, is very damaging uh, to the planet. So, you know, part of the agenda is to kind of seize back control of the economic story, reground it in science, and then use that to, you know, reconnect uh, our economic system into delivering better outcomes uh, for both people and planet. <coughs> Uh, John. Eric, thanks so much for this. I really liked that article you mentioned on uh, the theory of progress by uh, Tyler Cowen yep. and uh, Patrick Collison, the CEO of Stripe. Yep. Um, I can't help but to notice that all of the biophysical boundaries that you mentioned were being breached are things for which we don't have property rights. Mm -hmm. uh, the atmosphere, the oceans, federal lands in California, which are now ablaze. Uh, people and companies naturally tend to invest and preserve in things that they own, either for their own use or for trade. Uh, most recently, we saw rights extended to the electromagnetic spectrum, and even more recently, tentatively, through cap and trade to the environment. Would uh, market humanism mm -hmm. include ascribing an interest in the atmosphere, perhaps a one seven billionth share, uh, to the seven billion people on Earth? Mm -hmm. no, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good question, John. Um, so we need to um, put markets in a broader context. So if you, if you open most economics textbooks, they start usually with some description of exchange and, and trade uh, as a description of what the economy is. So you get this impression that the economy is largely about markets. But if you talk to the anthropologists, uh, you get a different story that um, you know, before you can have markets and exchange and trade, you need to have stuff, products and services, stone tools, hunting parties, you know, a physical and social organization. And that came out of human instincts for cooperation. 
Uh, markets and uh, well, private even notions of property came much later in, in uh, human development, and, mar and organized markets even later than 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 that. And you know that um, the economy really runs on huge networks of cooperation, and markets are one small slice of that huge uh, network. Uh, in in the new book, I, I liken it to. Um, uh, cooperation is sort of the dark matter of the economy. You know, it's 98% of the mass, but markets are kind of like the bright lights, the visible stars that are like 2% uh, of the mass, uh, just like in, in, in physics. And with, you know, by having such a um, narrow focus on markets that we've forgotten about the other 98% of, you know, what makes for uh, cooperative uh, societies that can do things like, you know, build very, you know, build very complicated products and services, have complex social organizations, and solve very uh, complex problems. And you know, to have large-scale cooperation, you need a whole set of social norms and cultural norms and institutional structures. There's a lot of infrastructure around large-scale cooperation that, get, can, that needs to be built. And what markets are good at is creating evolutionary competitions between those structures of cooperation. When markets can be harmful is when they, they actually um, reduce that cooperation and crowd it out. And so we have to be careful that you know, the, the neoclassical answer was almost always, uh, if there's a so-called market failure, the answer is create property rights, put a price on it. And in some cases, that might be the, the right answer. But in other cases, and Eleanor Ostrom uh, you know, did some very famous uh, work on this, that creating structures to enhance human cooperation may be the answer uh, as well. And that may be done through cultural norms, institutions, a whole set of other machinery that humans have evolved over uh, very long, long periods of time. So I would say don't forget the 98% of, of dark matter. Markets are important, but they're only one part of the broader picture. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I agree with uh, everything you said, um, but I think the, 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 the biggest problem is capitalism is a loaded coin. So every time you toss that coin, it rewards someone and someone maybe doesn't do as well. And the result is of tossing that coin billions of time is a chart that you showed uh, at the beginning, right? Like the people who have been able to exploit resources better are able to kind of run away with wealth you know, it was to stay behind, and you repeat the same scenario, you see it also at the, at the individual level, right? So the question is, how do we change that loaded coin that it's so ingrained in everyone, and that it's driving everyone's behavior, and that is leading to some outcomes that eventually may lead, lead to extinction, like you mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty big question. Um, well, first, uh, uh, you know, whether capitalism is a loaded coin or not is, is a choice. You know, again, capitalism is an imagined order. We can construct it in lots of different ways, or we can, you know, can construct uh, other ways of, of organizing the economy. Now, we know, you know, by saying it's an imagined order doesn't mean just anything goes. You know, we can construct the economy in really lousy ways. You know, so the, you know, Soviet experiment, uh, you know, was a pretty lousy way to construct an economy, and that failed uh, uh, pretty, uh, pretty badly. But um, you know, one of the m sort of myths that's come out of our current economic thinking is somehow that the order we have today is, again, the natural order. It's a sort of inevitable outcome of kind of human nature and, and, and so on. And that really diminishes how much choice we have in, uh, uh, in you know, constructing an order we want. Now, in order to construct a better order, we have to understand that order in a much more deep and scientific way than we do today to actually know what's going to improve it. And we also have to be humble in this complex system about our ability to forecast uh, things and be able to predict you know, what will actually uh, be uh, better. And we need new mechanisms to experiment our way to the future and harness the forces of, 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 of uh, evolution uh, in the system to experiment and find uh, better ways of doing it. But at, at the heart of, of um, you know, a system uh, that you know, mixes large-scale human cooperation and uses markets to create these evolutionary competitions um, is the greatest free lunch in history. You know, uh, economists like to say there is no free lunch, but we've been you know, living off of a free lunch ever since we started banging rocks together in caves. 
which is that by cooperating, we can do things we can't do on our own. You know, that we can solve ever more complex problems and create this bootstrapping dynamic uh, to create more complex physical objects like this laptop, more complex social structures like our systems of law and money and, and, and so on. And, um, you know, that is where economic value comes from. It comes from solving um, problems for us. So, you know, we all got the problem of, of how to get ourselves fed solved today by a very complex supply chain that delivered us lunch. Um, that was a huge dance of, 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 of cooperation. So we need to, you know, think about our system in a way that it is harnessing that free lunch of uh, cooperation in the most effective ways possible. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, in um, the back. So can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so a comment and then a question. The comment is the story of Israel going from a water-starved country to having a surplus which helps its neighbors mm -hmm. and also a big technology industry I think is exactly an example of a social contract at the bottom that led to technological innovation. So I just wanted to pass that on to you. Um, the question uh, comes from an experience I've had as a computer scientist. About 20, 25 years ago, a very famous systems computer scientist said, people will not take passwords and security seriously until there's a catastrophe. And that was true. So I might agree with what you have on this slide, but do we need a catastrophe to get to the geopolitical systems understanding this? So, well, actually, I'm going to take your first, first comment first, uh, and I'm very glad you brought up the word social contract, um, because um, uh, at, at the heart of large, you know, we, we, we can't create complex, durable networks of cooperation unless the contracts between the people cooperating are fair. Um, and inclusive and, you know, have a, uh, in, and engender trust and so on. And um, uh, one of the things that you see, there's a, uh, an academic literature called Varieties of Capitalism that looks at different ways of organizing uh, market systems and, you know, different outcomes that come from that. And one of the, you know, um, uh, clear findings from that empirical work is that societies based on fair social contracts um, are more innovative, more dynamic, um, uh, you know, uh, more inclusive in terms of sharing the gains of, of, of growth and create positive networks or positive feedbacks um, where uh, that uh, fairness and inclusiveness uh, leads to more uh, cooperation in the system um, and the ability to sort of march up the ladder of knowledge, creating, you know, solving more and more uh, complex uh, uh, problems. And what we argue in our, in our new book is that the kind of neoliberal conception of capitalism, which has denigrated you know, the ideas of social contracts, um, uh, has actually harmed that dynamic and reduced our capacity to innovate and reduced our capacity to, genu you know, to create progress and instead created a system that re rewards rent seeking and value extraction and, and, uh, and, and things like that. So I think at, at the heart of this conception is uh, and, and actually, um, the kind of work uh, Sam Bowles and Herb Gintis and others have done here is actually hugely informative in understanding what a fair social contract is. Uh, you know, you can get good empirical data on what people view as uh, fair in their social arrangements. Uh, on your last question, I'll just say, I hope not. So it was interesting, you uh, had a quote from Pinker. Mm -hmm. um, if you his book, Enlightenment Now, and then the, the work that the Roeblings had done, you know, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that, you know, there's been a lot of progress on a lot of metrics that aren't just growth of GDP. Yep. So you said you don't know what exactly how to define progress, but whether it's infant mortality or, you know, choices of leisure or the internet. And I think if I say, you know, paraphrasing him right, he attributes it to science and free markets. Mm -hmm. So one is, why is that not you know, some reconciliation for the current system as, as creating progress. And then somewhat related, um, the one thing that is clear from your picture and other things that, you know, this system leads us to ultimately destroying the planet. And I think the general from a lot of us would be the, the, the reasons for that are, you know, bad politics, bad religion, naivete. But, you know, if you're going to go back to the classical economist kind of view and say we're trying to maximize some version of utility, um, 
or you know, whatever you call it, pleasure, lack of pain, maybe that there's such a discount rate on, in the aggregation of these agents that you know, two, three, you know, three, four, five generations down the road, the discount rate is so high that it might be rational to move toward that. And I'm not sure like, if this room disagrees with that, that that would matter in the standpoint of what's the op optimal social system. Mm -hmm. So um, you, you raise an, an, a, a you know, number of, 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 of points there. Um, there one of my uh, favorite uh, cartoons on the climate change issue is it, it shows a uh, picture of a sort of post-apocalyptic planet and a couple of you know, people in rags huddled around a fire and one saying to the other, I think we got the discount rate wrong. <laughs> and you know, that, to me, kind of sums up the problem because if, if that's the question, if, 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 you know, if that's how things are framed, we're asking the wrong question. You know, we're just framing the problem in, in an entirely wrong way. And um, you know, framing it as a cost-benefit problem and discounting the future generations um, uh, is a longer conversation about that, but it, it's a deeply flawed uh, conceptual framework for tackling a problem. Uh, you know, where knowledge about the future is limited, you have, you know, fat tails and, and distributions, irreversibilities, there's a, you know, whole number of features of that problem that just make it entirely inappropriate for that framing at kind of a technical level. But there's a deeper moral question in that, and there's a big debate that's been going on in other parts of social science that hasn't quite reached economics yet, but needs to, which goes back to my little moral philosophy, tiny doll at, at the bottom which is we've had this um, hedonic conception of the moral good, that basically the purpose of life is to maximize pleasure. You know, uh, it goes back to Epicurus and you know, the idea that the good life is one where you know, we're living it up, you know, basically it's a big party. Um, now, there's you know, a couple of problems with that view. Um, one is it's just contestable from a kind of moral philosophical standpoint. Uh, but it also actually doesn't fit with the empirical work on, on moral psychology when uh, you know, people try to understand what people actually really do think of as the good life. That we are much more multidimensional than that. Um, sure, I like to have ice cream. I love ice cream, in fact. It gives me great pleasure. But is the purpose of, of life to get as much ice cream as I can? No. You know, we all have a much broader set of purposes uh, in our life, and this ties more closely to the Aristotelian philosophy of, of eudaimonia, of human flourishing, of the idea of the good life um, is having multiple dimensions uh, uh, to it, including uh, social connections, purpose, being able to contribute, dignity, place in society. Um, so, you know, not this sort of narrow consumption of us as just, you know, pleasure seekers and, and pain uh, uh, avoiders. And led by the uh, ecological economists, there's now a movement to bring this broader conception of the good into economics. And that leads to a you know, very different way of set of measuring progress than things like GDP. So you start thinking of progress in terms of, you know, do people have good health care? Do they have decent housing? Do they have jobs that give them you know, uh, a standard of living and, and, and personal dignity? Do people have autonomy and control in their lives? You know, a whole set of other uh, dimensions uh, to human well-being uh, than just maximizing uh, pleasure. And, you know, that is critical because the system of maximizing consumption, of maximizing pleasure, is literally eating the planet. Yes, in the back. Oh, hi, Eric. Um, there are some anthropologists who are using the word cooperation to talk about like feudal lords and serfs working together. Mm -hmm. And obviously that doesn't include the tremendous power dimension in the definition. I'm wondering how you are defining and using cooperation. Um, yeah, I should always be careful when there's professional anthropologists in the room <laughs> who, know, who know about these things better than I do. Um, uh, so uh, th this it goes back to the uh, point about social contracts that was, was raised before. So, um, you know, again, um, a, a economists actually kind of assumed power out of the field. You know, if you look in the equations of, econom of economists or standard economics, you don't see power in there. Yet power relations matter hugely in our social structures and whether cooperation works or doesn't work, or is it, is it you know, non-zero-sum cooperation or is it simply rent extraction and exploit 
exploitation. Now, uh, there's actually a lot of interest in this in, in economics now, and there's a lot of work going on to kind of bring power uh, back in. Um, but uh, I think as part of our broader understanding of economic uh, cooperation, uh, you know, a, a deeper understanding of what kind of power relations lead to that sort of expanding dynamic of more inclusion, more cooperation, more problem solving, delivering good outcomes for people, and, and which ones just lead to kind of exploitation and actually long-term collapses uh, in, in, in cooperation is, is an important part of the agenda. Now, I, I see the time has just gone to zero, so uh, David's saying one last question. So who's, who's going to ask me this stumping, stumping question to, to finish on? Yeah. So has it, have you given any consideration to extending <clears throat> the ideas you're talking about to other species and comparing cooperation in other species with how we do it? And is there, I mean, is this trivial or is there some use in that that might inform us in different ways? Uh, no, it's, it's hugely informative. And again, I'm in a room where there are people who actually do this for a living uh, who know a lot more about it uh, than I do. But, the, you know, um, uh, we've learned a lot from cross-species comparisons uh, on these behaviors because humans aren't the only cooperative species. Um, and also, humans aren't the only species that order their environment, um, that create uh, order to solve their problems. Um, there's lots of other species that manipulate their environment in ways to create niches that are more successful for themselves. And uh, I've personally learned a ton from reading this literature and talking to colleagues in it. Uh, but again, it hasn't really penetrated the walls of economics very much. So, uh, you know, in, in the long list of areas where SFI could, you know, contribute uh, on, on this, um, you know, I think uh, bringing this, this broader uh, cross-species perspective, broader anthropological, uh, archaeological perspective, um, you know, integrating uh, more on, uh, uh, you know, uh, psychology and so on in, into economics could be uh, hugely productive. So, you know, just to, just to finish off, I, I think, um, you know, if I had to name one place in the world um, where the right questions are being asked and where there are capabilities to, um, to really uh, push forward a program to answer those questions, it's here. Thank you.